To him and ask him about his ministry and, and, and what he's passionate about, and that I, I really think that we can uh, bookmark some of his words of wisdom so that we can use it on, in later conversation in life. So, uh, the first person, please. For the, the very kind words. Uh, Happy New Year. Um, when I first came to Singapore, I was told by some people not to say Happy Chinese New Year. But then later I found out all my friends say Chinese, Happy Chinese New Year. So I'm a bit confused. So I'll just say Happy New Year. And I have 12 students that I meet with every week. It's called PCG, Pastoral Care Group. And uh, this Thursday was our um, retreat. So we spent 8 a.m., uh, sorry, 9 a.m. to 12 noon. Celebrations. And they said a whole bunch of positive stuff and a whole bunch of negative stuff. So I concluded by asking, so do you guys have a love-hate relationship with Chinese New Year? And they said yes. So <laughs> regardless, happy Chinese New Year. I want to start with a disclaimer. I don't think there's conflict in the church here. And I don't think you guys are bad church. I'm saying that because I'm speaking from the passage that is uh, uh, 1 Corinthians chapters 1 through 4 each day and the next two Sundays, a passage that Paul is addressing the Corinthians when they are going through conflict, right? So I don't want you to assume I think that you are going to conflict and that's why I'm speaking on that. Not at all. But what I will show you today, next Sunday and the following Sunday, is Paul's way of approaching conflict or lack of love. That's the title that I would use for here. How can we love people more? It is not just simply saying, love each other, which is probably what we would have said. We would have said, be kind to each other, be loving to each other, or forgive each other. So this week we will see how the cross of the Christ, the Son, is driving us to do something more than what we usually read the, in this passage. And then next week we will see how the mystery of, Christ, uh, of the Father is driving us to love one another. And the final Sunday, we will talk about how the work of the Holy Spirit is driving people to love one another. So those are my general outline. But to people of Corinthians. Matter of fact, <laughs> when I was growing up in church and then when I went to Bible college and seminary, I always heard how bad the Corinthians were. <laughs> So when I was in my early 30s, a friend of mine asked me to write a commentary on Corinthians. And my first thought to him was, oh, I don't want to write on Corinthians. They're bad people. But my friend said to me, you are on the lowest of the list, and none of them wants First Corinthians, so I'm assigning you First Corinthians. Looking back 30 years later, 
I am so grateful for assigning me uh, First Corinthians because the more I study, I fell in love with the Corinthians. <laughs> Matter of fact, seven years ago, uh, one of the Singaporean friends sent Lori and I to Corinth to see because she heard me say in the classroom all the time, I love the Corinthians, I love the Corinthians. Someday I would love to go see Corinth. And she went and, and I don't know who she is. I have a guess who she is. She went and uh, told the dean, send Andrew and Lori to Corinth. I will pay for that. So we did go and see Corinth, and kind of my dream came true. I realized how wrong I was in some of my <laughs> understanding of Corinth till I went there. All that is to say, the reason I love Corinthians is that there are ordinary people like me, people who struggle with issues like conflict, struggle with issues like internal fight, strife, but at the same time, they love the Lord and they love their apostle. Man, but that's a beautiful verse in First Corinthians 11. That's what changed my life. It was 11 1. And Paul says to them, No one had kept the tradition as I have taught you as much as you have. Right? So they were very faithful to keep the tradition that Paul taught them. But on things that Paul didn't teach them, they were a little bit off, right? So they're like baby Christians. They're like me that wants to do right and doesn't always do right because doesn't always know what is the right thing to do. But I intend to, and that's the way the Corinthian church worked. Having said all of that, there are three main struggles that they have that Paul deals with in the first six chapters of First Corinthians. I'm still in the background information, so bear with me next, next week. I will bring an outline that you can look at. Uh, the first four chapters, first six chapters talk about three main problems that they had. Number one, there was a little bit division, and that's what we will focus on the next three days. The second was immorality, and the third one was so chapter four and five and six talk about the lack of community, sexual immunity that has been pictured, and what they've done seeing each other. That is a lot of work. I want to talk about the division that they have. And the problem is that he wants to come in to have division. This is the way that we need it. Although they have been humiliated in division. We need to come in to have the division. But instead of going to go and have the division, we need to move the list to all the time of contribution. We can only study these passages and realize that we really do that there are a lot of that are there that talk about three different topics. All to do with the word of Christ, the proper word of the cross of Christ. The thing that I get is to see the many things. We found a beautiful song about the cross. The first thing that comes to us when we hear about the cross is redemption. Cannot set aside. Paul will refer to redemption in this passage that we will see today, but he will not expand on redemption. He would refer to redemption. He would actually use different words. He would use the word reconciliation. He would use the word righteousness, and he would use the word redemption. Right? But he won't outline of what Jesus did on the cross in this chapter one, possibly because. When Paul visited the Corinthians, he told them in person, right? And then he had written about that in the book of, about that in the book of Galatians, 
written about that in the book of Ephesians and Colossians and many of his writings and even Corinthians, he would refer to it, but he will not outline the entirety of what redemption is. Right? But instead, he will focus on two other R words. We have redemption, but the second that I want to talk about is reconciliation. Reconciliation, again, we think of recon reconciliation between God and people, right? We sing the song in, in On the Cross, uh, God's anger was reconciled, right? We use that word for reconciliation. But what Paul will focus today, or in this particular passage that we would look at, is reconciliation between people, right? That is an important thing that happened on the cross, and I will show that to you. Uh, there was a huge enmity between two groups of people, and Jesus reconciled that on that cross, right? So the cross is not only about redemption, the first word that we need to know, and I will repeat that many times, and the second word, it is about reconciliation. Not only the heaven and earth reconciliation, God and people reconciliation, but also reconciliation between people and people. The third word that we need to know and remember today about, it, it's another word, our word, realignment, right? And a long time ago, we actually had a car. <laughs> we had several cars. In Singapore, we don't have a car. But I remember the first time I went to get my tall uh, car tires rotated and realigned, right? And I, I'm not an engineer. I'm not science major. I am a theologian and love music. That ends my, hist my life history, right? So I asked that guy, but I am always curious. So I asked that guy, why do you rotate the tires? And why do you realign the tire? So he walked me aside to another car that had not done that. And somehow the way the car is and the way the roads are, if you don't realign the tires and rotate the tires, they don't evenly use up the tire part. Remember, they have wrong grooves on them because they've been going the wrong direction. So realignment is very crucial just for a car and a tire. The same is true we would see today in today's passage. We need to sometimes realign ourselves. Okay, So when we come to think of the cross, we are very familiar with the redemption that cross brings. And I will not take an ounce away from what the, what the cross does for our redemption. Right? Our sins are forgiven, and we've been reconciled with God. But there's also reconciliation. How are we put together, not only with God, but also with each other? Right? And the third thing that we will talk about today is how the cross of Christ realigns us to a healthier place that we should be in. Okay? That's my outline. But now let's look at the passage. But before we go to the passage, let me say one more thing. And that helps us to understand. You have had several preachers come and speak and you have your own pastor. It's easy to form what's called clickishness or favoritism. Lori and I went to the same college, but her favorite professor and my favorite professors are night and day different. My professor read the footnotes. If we made a wrong error in the footnote, he corrected that. And if we quoted that what's called Turabian wrongly, he quoted that to the point we called Dr. Honer Dr. Turabian. Right? He was detailed. But Lori's favorite professor was the most loving person in the whole campus, Dr. Hannah. Right? That kind of shows our personalities also, right? The same way. Corinthians had four amazing teachers in their lives. Number one, Paul. Now, you know about Paul. He's a great apostle for the Gentiles. 
He was logical. He was smart writer. He was a Roman citizen, right? And and he's a good arguer, right? If you read uh, Romans and Corinthians, you see how he is beautiful in his presentation and some of that we will see. But there was someone even greater than him. His name is Apollos. We briefly read about him in Acts chapter 18. Apollos is from Egypt, a place called Alexandria. He's a Jew. He knew everything about Jesus except for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And he was an eloquent speaker. Paul was not an eloquent speaker. Paul was an eloquent writer. But he was, uh, Apollos was an eloquent speaker. So that would have been tension. Hey, I like Paul. He's pretty simple. I know he's not a good speaker, but he is an amazing person in writing. And he's a pretty friendly guy, we think, right? Or maybe he's a bit strict guy that we don't know. But the other group would say, but I really, really, really like Apollos. When he speaks, we had a pastor friend in Memphis, and when he speaks, I had no clue what he was talking about. Lori loved every bit of it <laughs> because he would quote Shakespeare, he would quote Shelley, he would quote Beatles. I am too simple for all of that. Right? The same way they would say, hey, I like Apollos. He is eloquent. Right? But there's a third fellow. His name is Cephas, or we would call him Peter. He is the first of the apostles. He, unlike Paul and Apollos, walked with the Lord. Matter of fact, he even walked on the water by himself, approaching the Lord Jesus. He ate the bread that Jesus divided. He saw Jesus on the cross. He saw Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. He saw Jesus resurrect. Right? So some people said, I know you're really after Paul. I know you're really after Apollos. But we like Mr. Cephas because he saw the miracles. He walked on water. Plus, he's the only guy that travels with his wife. We really like his wife. Right? So there's a third group in the Corinthian church that says, I like Paul. I, one group says, I like Paul. One group says, I like Apollos. And the third group says, I like Christ. And then comes the holy ones. The holy one says, oh, you're all going after humans. We really like Jesus Christ. <laughs> we don't compare ourselves to anyone else. Right? We are of Christ. Right? Now, imagine a church as small as us or as large as the 300, I mean, 3,000, 4,000 church that divides into four groups. That's not a healthy church, right? So Chloe, a lady, possibly neighbor to the church in, uh, church in Corinth, had sent messages to Paul to say there is a conflict in the church. So that's where we are coming in, right in the middle of it, and we have Four chapters to deal with, but Paul would talk about the cross of Christ in chapter one, uh, the mystery of God in chapter two, and then the work of the Holy Spirit in chapter three and four to explain. Don't take sides with people. There is a much greater mystery to Christian life than following one teacher or the other teacher, right? And that's where we come in. So keep that in mind as we go through. Please turn with me to your, your Bible to uh, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, verse 10. Uh, my translation would sound slightly different than whatever translations you have. But just remember, it's just another translation that I would explain in a moment. Right? I, I, when there are conflicts. He says, I say, I ask you siblings, and some of your Bible would say brothers, and some of them would say brothers and sisters, through the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, that is, so that there may not be any divisions, schism among you, that may you may be strengthened in him 
in mind and of the same opinion. It is revealed to me concerning you by those of Chloe's family siblings there are stripes among you. What I mean is this. Each of you says, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius and verse 16 and the house of the Stephanas. None of the others I don't know. So that none of you may say, verse 15, I was baptized in Paul's name. Because Christ did not send me to baptize, but to proclaim claim the good news to evangelize, not in the wisdom of words, human words, so that the cross of Christ may be emptied. Let's stop there for a moment, right? That sets us in the scene. He's saying, I hear from Chloe's family, there's four divisions in the, in the crowd. Right? Scholars say, uh, there was about 60 to 100 people in Corinthian church, right? And if it is 60 people, and if my math is correct, that is 15 in each group. <laughs> Good job, Lord, he says. Yeah, I always make mess up in math, right? And if it is 100, that is 25 in each group, right? That is, if you imagine again, 60, that's 15, it's like two and a half families in one group. That's not good at all, right? But it, what is interesting is it seems to be, this is not a big fight as much as a verbal fight. Matter of fact, he says, each one says, each one says, each one says, right? So they're going around saying, hey, I'm of Apollo. You imagine having a, a name badges that are pink or all Apollos, blue or all Paul, and yellow <laughs> or Cephas, right? They're going around saying, I belong to this group, I belong to that group, I belong to that group. Because it is verbal, and this is one place that my text read slightly different than yours, 110, I said, you all say the same thing, right? And the thing that they need to say is cross. That's the word they need to say. Matter of fact, he would go on to say, the cross of Christ, the cross of Christ, Christ crucified, Christ crucified. He would say that four times in this next passages, and he would use a word in Greek, one is lego, which means to say, and the other one is logos, a word that you're familiar with, the word, right? He's saying, instead of saying, I am of Apollos, instead of saying, I am of Paul, say, the cross of Christ, the cross of Christ, the cross of Christ, and the cross of Christ, right? The reason we need to say the cross of Christ, which we will come to in a moment, is because all of a sudden the focus would go away from people and leaders and divisions into what the Lord Jesus did on the cross. Right? So he wants them to move away from isolation, separation, division into unity. Talking about the cross of Christ. Lori and I have said this many times. When we have friends over and we ended up gossiping or saying, um, uh, silly, having silly conversation, and then they go away, or the, it could be the other way around too, that when we go to somebody's house and we gossip or we fight or we chat or we say bad things, and then when we go home, we don't feel healthy anymore. We don't feel uplifted. But there are friends that we get together with them, and all of our conversations about Jesus. Of course, it's about our children too. But we knew the focus was always on the cross of Christ, 
that when we finally left, we were there uplifted, right? We went home charged. We went home and wanted to live for the Lord. I have a couple of amazing friends like that. Every time I get together, I go back rededicating my life. I saw a friend of mine two weeks ago uh, at a conference, and I haven't seen him in more than a year. And we spent just two hours possibly together, and I felt like I was going through a revival all over again. Right? And that's what he is saying. Instead of saying, I am of Apollos, I am of Paul, I am of Cephas, and focusing on various teachings, focus on the cross of Christ. Speak about the cross of Christ. Right? And then he would explain why we should speak about the cross of Christ. Now, he does say something negative, but he moves on very quickly, and that is, don't talk about I baptized you. Because even if I baptized you, I only baptized you in the name of Christ. Because none of us, Apollo, Cephas, or me, when we baptize you, we are baptizing you in our name. We are baptizing you in the Lord Jesus' name. And now turn with me to uh, verses 18 to 25, because this is what I think he is bringing in the concept of redemption and reconciliation. He says, the word of, of the cross, or the logos of the cross, is foolishness to those who are destroying and the power of God to those who are being saved. Okay? There's a difference between how the world and Christians look at the cross. And we'll go on to the rest of it and we'll come and explain. As it is written, I, I will destroy the wisdom of wise people and set aside the understanding of the intellectual. Who is the wise person? Where are the scribes? Where is the philosopher of this world? Hasn't God ruled the wisdom of this world? In the wisdom of God, the world hasn't known him, though its wisdom, uh, through its wisdom, it hasn't known God. God was pleased to save those who believe through the foolishness of what we proclaim. While the Jews seek signs and the Greeks seek wisdom, we proclaim Christ, the crucified one. It is scandalous to the Jewish people and foolishness to the Gentile people. But to those who are called to salvation, whether they are Jews or Greeks, Christ is the power of God. Christ is the wisdom of God. Since God's foolishness is wiser than man's wisdom, God's weakness is stronger than people's. Uh, weakness, uh, strength. Yeah? Again, what he is doing is very clever. He says, look at the world around us. The world has decided they will determine what God is like or how the world was created like with their own wisdom. And as a result, they have not understood God at all. Yeah? I love watching uh, science shows, um, um, NASA stuff and all things like that. And I, it always amazes me how much faith a person should actually have in order to believe what they're telling us. Okay. I was telling Lori this last week. Uh, NASA announced that they were able to find the street lights. You can Google this up and find it, right? On a planet seven trillion light years away. Now, that sounds amazing. But do you know how much guesswork goes into that? <laughs> to actually see as street lights in a planet that is seven trillion light years away. And I thought, I really want to believe this, but I know it really, really, really isn't true, right? Because by their own declaration, 
those street lights would have left seven trillion years ago and traveled that long for the web telescope to pick it up and for us to interpret it as a street light, right? I don't know. <laughs> I'm happy for them to tell me that a new planet's being formed. But I wanted to write to them and said, are there any Teslas on those streets? Uh, but I don't think they would answer me. <laughs> yeah. By human wisdom, many cultures, many religions, many nations have tried to understand God. You can understand God by science. You can understand God by wisdom. The reason is very simple. God had made it impossible to be understood by science, knowledge, wisdom, mysteries, and science. Instead, he has a way that he wants people to understand him that sounds absolutely foolish to the world. And that method is called the cross of Christ. Right? Now, if Paul goes on to say, uh, Paul had already said, he says, while the Jews seek signs and wonders to know who God is, and the Greeks and Gentiles seek uh, wisdom, uh, Sophia, knowledge to understand who God is, he had blinded them all and said, hey, do you really want to know who I am? Know it to the cross. Yeah, an element that everyone thought was scandalous, an element that everyone at that time thought was foolishness. And we had to go a little bit back into the history to see this. Okay, I'll just give a summary, and you can read about this in Galatians 3. First element, right? The first element is, how did the Jewish thought this is scandalous? There was a Deuteronomy verse that said, if a person is punished for his crime and he is delayed on the tree, hung on a tree in the land, by evening, you should take his body off the cross, off the tree, so that the land will not be cursed. Right? The reason the book of Deuteronomy tells us that statement, which is in Galatians chapter 3, is because in those days, if you really wanted to shame a person, you would strip him naked, hang him on a tree, sometimes called cross, and you leave him there till he totally rots, right? I am using the word he all the time because very rarely they did that to women, right? The classic example, you can read about this in the Old Testament, when they captured Jonathan and Saul, they delayed them or hung them on a tree in Betsha on for the people to see. Because they're supposed to look at them and say, hey, that guy must have been a very bad guy. That's why he is hanging there for three days, four days, five days. First naked, but then all the flesh stripped off by vultures and other animals. Horrible way to die. Matter of fact, the people on the cross back then would cry and cry and cry saying to people, kill us. Kill us because the suffering is horrible. A fellow by the name Tac Tacitus describes them. Vultures start with your eye. Then they move on to your soft body parts. Yeah? Eventually, they even eat your bones. And many would hang on the cross for seven days. The Lord, on the other hand, did not want that happen in, in, in his land. Yeah, In his land, if they were to punish someone and they were to hang them on the cross, they can only let them hang them on the cross until the evening. By evening, they need to take him down. 
right? They cannot go over to next day or the next day up to seven days, right? But over the course of time, now if you remember the story of the Lord Jesus on the cross, he was taken down by Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus before the sun set, right? They're following the rule. But because that statement said, cursed is anyone who hungs on a tree, they started to say, anyone who was hung on a tree, especially a cross of Roman cross, was not God's person, was under the curse of God, right? So the minute they saw Jesus on the cross, on a cross, they didn't think that was the power of God. They didn't think it was the wisdom of God. They didn't think like you and I do, the redemption of God. They didn't think it was reconciliation of God. They said, that guy must have been cursed. Classic example is Paul, right? Because Paul was a rabbi at that time. He sees Jesus on the cross. I mean, he would have, even though he never mentions it, he would have because he was a Gamaliel student in Jerusalem. And he came to the conclusion he must have been a sinner. That's why God let him hang on the cross until he saw the resurrected Lord, right? The minute he saw the resurrected Lord, his whole theology changed, right? And that's why he goes to the cross as the cross of Christ. The Hebrews, the Jews, thought of someone hanging on the cross, a cursed cross or a Curse the death of God. That's why it was scandalous to them. The Romans, on the other hand, or the Greeks, on the other hand, they knew only the criminals were hung on a cross. The people that rebelled against Rome, the people that rebelled against Greeks, the people that rebelled against the society, right? So to both groups to say, you know that fellow that hung on the cross, Jesus? He is God's power. He is God's wisdom. He is God's salvation. Sounded absolutely scandalous and absolutely foolish. That is not wisdom in their mind. That is not power in their mind. But to those who believe, the cross of Christ is the only wisdom of God. The cross of Christ, the death of Jesus on the cross is the only power of God or demonstrated power of God. There's another interesting thing. Remember I talked about the redemption of Christ and we keep seeing this in this passage. But along with redemption, there is also something called reconciliation. Reconciliation we see it between God and people, and that word is used many times that Jesus reconciled us to God. Reconciliation is when there are two groups that are fighting against each other. Someone comes and uh, puts an enmity aside. And God reconciled, I mean, Jesus reconciled God to people. There's no question about it. But what is interesting is if you read both Ephesians I will give you these references, Ephesians 2.16 and Colossians 2.14. If you remember Ephesians and Colossians, they are parallel books. And chapter 2, verses 14 and 16, or 16 and 14, you'll come to this really interesting concept. And that is the enmity between Jews and the enmity between Gentiles. Jesus nailed the enmity on the cross by nailing the law that separated the Jews and the Gentiles. Right? And I need to give a little bit more flesh to this to understand, right? One group had the law, and the other group did not have the law, right? Imagine, let's divide the ch church into two groups here. One group has the secret code how to get out of the law through, and the other group did not have the secret code, right? So who's going to escape? The one with the secret code. But what if they don't share it with a group that doesn't have, right? That's how the law behaved. Sadly, that's not what God intended. 
But that's how it became historically, right? God gave the law to the Israelites, hoping they would follow the law. They would teach the law to the nations around them. They would bring people into their community. You remember uh, Rahab came in uh, during Joshua's time and um, uh, Ruth came in later on, Boaz's time. Other people did come into God's group, the Israelites. That's what they were supposed to do. That's part of the Abrahamic blessings. All the nations would be blessed in you, right? But what happened was the Israelites who had the law, they kept it to themselves. They said, we have the law. We know what's right to do. You don't know what's right to do. So we are a special group of people, right? And the enmity got so bad. You remember that one incident in Antioch? Peter goes to Antioch, and all the people there are Gentiles, and they're all eating pork and shrimp and all the food that the Jews are not supposed to eat. And Peter sits down and eats with them. Well, I don't know if he ate non-kosher food, but he sat with them. But as soon as people from Jerusalem came, Peter got up from the table and walked away and acted hypo hypocritically. Right? He said, oh, I don't associate with the Jews. Right? This is after he was sent by God to Cornelius' house in, First uh, sorry, in Acts chapter 10. Right? The enmity gotten so bad, Jesus had to come and take the law that divided the people and hang it on the cross, nail it on the cross. Right? And that's how Paul uses this word cross many other places like the Ephesians and Colossians references, where not only did on the cross the enmity between God and people went away, the enmity between Jews and Gentiles went away. Paul became friends with Titus, a Gentile. Paul became friends with Timothy, a half Gentile, half Jew. Paul became the uh, uh, Paul uh, uh, circumcised on the eighth day, a Hebrew of Hebrew, uh, uh, Saul's descendant. A perfect Jew, a Pharisee, one who kept the law, one who was blameless, a Gamaliel student, he becomes a minister to the Gentile. Yeah? He became best friend with Luke, who wrote the book of Luke Acts, a Gentile from Macedonia. Right? There was no longer enmity between Jew and Gentile as the result of the cross of Christ. So there is not only reconciliation in the cross of Christ, there is also, sorry, there's not only redemption in the cross of Christ, there is also reconciliation in the cross of Christ between God and people and between people and people. Paul wants the people in Corinthians to know this because that's the reason they can't have division among themselves. That's the reason they need to be one because cross is more than mere, uh, not mere, cross is more than spiritual redemption. It is personal reconciliation. If Christians fight, they haven't understood the cross of Christ. When we have fight, we need to go back to the cross and start talking about the cross and understanding what happened on the cross. Not only redemption, but also reconciliation. But there's one more beautiful stuff that happened on the cross. Read with me from 20, 26 to 31. Look at you. At the time of your calling, not many of you were wise, according to human standards. Not many of you were powerful. Not many of you were of noble birth. 
Now, I like what Dr. Uh, Gordon Fee said. Whenever Paul says not many, that means there were some. Matter of fact, one of the leading men that hosted the church uh, in Corinth, uh, let, let me start with the leading woman who hosted the church in Corinth, is Priscilla. Priscilla is from a noble family in Rome called Prisca. My friend, the Prisca family appointed emperors. They were proconsuls. They're one of the richest, they're like the Kennedys of America. Yeah? And that's where Priscilla is from. Now, possibly she lost some of that status when she married a Jew, Aquila. Yeah, and she was one of the founding ladies of the church in Corinth. And there was a fellow named Erastus. We can even now see his signature in, there's a street in Corinth that is named after him. He was a city, um, uh, like a city works uh, leader. One of our, like our M MPs. Yeah, and he was a Christian. Gaius was a Christian. Stephanus were Christian. These are all leading men in Corinth. But there were also a lot of slaves in the church back then, right? So he says, not many of you are wise according to human standard. Not many of you are powerful. Not many of you are, uh, of, you are of noble birth. At the time of your calling, keep that in mind. He goes on to say, but God chose the foolish people of the world to shame the wise. So that the boasting might not be in one's wisdom. God chose the weaklings of this world. So that the boasting might not be in one's strength. God chose those without a genealogy in this world. So that he may shame those who with genealogy without a noble birth. Without a genealogy. So that no flesh or people may boast before God. Yeah. By him, you are in Christ, who has become wisdom for us, from God, righteousness, holiness, redemption, so that the one who boasts may boast in the Lord. Right? Now, what is interesting about this, at the time of their calling, they were not the smartest. Now, in chapter 3, he would say, but we do speak wisdom to the wise, right? Because knowing Jesus as our salvation, knowing the cross of Christ as our glory, we really are wise people, right? My mom is now with the Lord, and she probably would be embarrassed I'm telling this story, but I'll tell you this story. I hated school growing up. <laughs> I was dumb. I loved music. I loved running around, doing everything, but I hated studies. Although I enjoyed knowledge, right? I would listen to my teachers when they were good and entertaining and gave me information, but I hated reading. So I heard my mom said to one of our neighbors one time, I have two small daughters and a mentally challenged son. <laughs> so when I finished my doctoral dissertation, I gave it to my mom and said, you're mentally the chartered son. I got something out of him, right? Now, my mom really loves me and I really love her. There's no question about it. But in, I, I know when I changed, right? When I went to Bible college and I fell in love with God's word, that's when I started enjoying studying. Now I enjoy studying all the time. Not all topics, <laughs> but my topic, right? So Paul is saying to them, not many of you were wise. Not many of you were strong. Not many of you were of noble birth at the time of your calling to Christ. It's going to change. But having said that, he would say, but some of them were wise people. Some of them were strong people. Some of them were of noble birth. But what really matters is when we come to Christ, we realize he changes us. He takes the dumbest people, forgive me for saying that, and makes them the smartest in his kingdom. The weakest people and makes them the strong. 
not on themselves, but in him. This is the realignment of our parts, right? Paul would say, Paul wrote Romans about the same time he wrote uh, First Corinthians. And Paul would say in Romans, have a good look at yourself. And then he would say, then arrange yourself, right? Don't think too highly of yourself, which we have many of us struggle with that. There's also another thing he would say. Don't think too low of yourself. Again, many of us struggle with that. And he would go on to say, think soberly of yourself. In Corinthians, he would say, align yourself with the cross of Christ. Know who you were at the time of Christ. Know who you are now in Christ so that your only boasting is in the Lord. Not in you. Yeah? It drives me crazy when people get up to give the testimonies and they describe how bad they were first and how good they are leaving Christ out of the picture. We are to have a good realignment of who we really are. Paul would say elsewhere, stand in the front of the mirror and look at yourself in the mirror. And I have a good idea how glorious God made you. And how glorious God had transformed you. But only so that we would boast in the Lord. I am who I am. We should say to ourselves, not because of me, not an ounce because of me. I am who I am because of the cross of Christ, because of who the Lord Jesus is. It's he who transformed a weakling to a mighty one, a foolish person into a wise person, a person with no nobility at all into a son and daughter of the high king. Well, we are royal family only because of the Lord Jesus Christ. Corinthians had divisions and the best way, best way for them to get over the division, the first best way was to look at the cross of Christ. I don't think we have divisions, but yet there are times we could be a little bit misaligned. Yeah? We could have little frustrations with people, and we can have some disagreements with people, or our love could turn cold towards people. Whatever the circumstances is, we're supposed to look at the cross of Christ. Whatever the disagreement is, we are supposed to look at the cross of Christ. And the cross of Christ does three amazing things for us. Brings us redemption. And he brings us, secondly, reconciliation. Not only between God and people, but people and people. And thirdly, it realigns us. Gives us a good and clear perspective of who we are. I grew up so feeling guilty all the time. Matter of fact, even now, I struggle with that. I wake up and the first thought that goes through my mind is, what did I hor do horribly wrong yesterday? <laughs> and I lay in my bed pretty much every morning and I had to say the cross to me. I would say, it is a new day. Doesn't matter what I did wrong yesterday. But I will live for the Lord today. Yeah, Realign myself to the cross of Christ. I do it every single morning. Yeah, Because that's the only way I can pick myself up and continue on with the rest of the day. Yeah? Let's reassign ourselves or realign ourselves to the cross of Christ. But I want to go back and show one more thing that we need to possibly repeat 
again and again to ourselves. Paul introduced Jesus, first of all, as the power of God, verse 24. Then he introduced Jesus as the wisdom of God, verse 24. Then he introduced himself as the wisdom again, which is the repetition in verse 30. But then he added three more things. He is the righteousness of God, verse 30. He is the holiness of God, verse 30. He is the redemption of God. The reason Paul gives us five characters about Jesus is because he doesn't want us to look to ourselves but to the Lord Jesus, because these are five areas where we fail. We feel weak. And when we feel weak, we say to ourselves, Jesus is the power of God. He is with me. In him, I'm powerful. We feel foolish. And when we feel foolish, we say to ourselves, Jesus is the wisdom of God. The cross is the wisdom of God. And then we feel unrighteous, sinful, untouchable in some way. We say to ourselves, but Jesus is my righteousness. We feel unholy, always sinning, always unable to live up to the standard that we ourselves set on us. And we say to ourselves, Jesus is the holiness of God. And then finally, we sometimes, I don't anymore, but I know many of my Christian friends do. We feel like we are not worthy of God's love. And we say to ourselves, Jesus is the redemption of God. It is because of the cross of Christ, we can call God Abba Father, not because of who we are, but because of the cross of Christ and the Lord Jesus. Yeah. He is our power. He is our wisdom. He is our righteousness. He is our holiness. He is the source of our redemption between God and us and between people and people. Shall we pray? Father, what an amazing Lord that you have given us. And the more we study what he has done and what the cross means, we can, we can begin to appreciate you for your wisdom your knowledge, your skillfulness to give us a salvation out of something shameful like a cross, something scandalous like a cross. But thank you for bringing us to redemption so that we see the value of that cross. We see how that, va of that cross, the value of that cross, how that cross reconciles us, not only between you and us, between people and us, it brings us redemption and how that cross realigns us so that we have a right attitude about ourselves, right evaluation of ourselves, neither highly nor lowly, but as how the Lord Jesus sees us so that in him we may boast. In Jesus' name we pray.